Hello, I'm Graham Priest again, and this is the sixth of the short lectures in which I'm talking about the relationship between Buddhism and science. And uh, at the moment, we're sort of in the middle of a discussion about logic. Logic being uh, a science, as shown by the fact that it can be mathematized. So in the last lecture, we talked a little bit about Western logic, and I talked about two principles which are fairly orthodox in Western logic. One was the uh, principle that every declarative sentence is uh, either true or false. That's the principle of excluded middle. And another principle of non-contradiction which says it can't be both. So that's excluded middle, non-contradiction. And as I said, these are relatively orthodox in the history of Western philosophy. So what I want to do now is to uh, go a little bit east uh, from Athens to um, somewhere in northeast India. And we're going to talk about um, a view that you find uh, in Buddhism called the Chaturshkoti. So Chaturshkoti is a Sanskrit word. It means something like four points or four corners uh, in Greek, tetralemma. And uh, the Chaturshkoti is a view Essentially, that uh, if you take a declarative statement, it may be true, false, both, or neither. So you can see that, in principle, it's a view which challenges both excluded middle and non-contradiction. So what I want to do today is talk about the Chaturshkoti. Now, uh, let me, let's start with having a look at where the Chaturshkoti appears in Buddhist logic. So, um, in the early sutras, the Buddha is talking about various issues, and the people listening to him ask questions. And in one of the sutras, uh, the people listening to the Buddha uh, ask what happens to someone who is enlightened after they die. All right. So uh, being enlightened is not like going to heaven. You can be enlightened in this life. Okay. How do you know? Well, the Buddha was enlightened. So, you know, we know what it's like to be enlightened in this life. It's to be like the Buddha. But hey, what happens to an enlightened person after they die? And, you know, naturally the people who are listening to the Buddha's teachings were kind of curious about this, as you would be. So let me tell you a little bit, or let's, let me uh, read to you a little bit about one of the sutras where uh, the people listening to the Buddha ask the Buddha this question. And the dialogue goes like this. Remember, the Buddha's name is Gautama. Okay. How is it, Master Gautama? Does Master Gautama hold the view after death a Tathagata exists? Only this is true and anything else is false. Now, a Tathagata is just... Uh, don't worry about what it means literally, it's just referring to someone who's achieved enlightenment, okay? So they're saying, hey, uh, Gautama, after someone's achieved enlightenment, uh, does that person exist? Is that true? And Vaka, that's the name of the interlocutor, the Buddha says, I don't hold the view. After death, a Tathagata exists, only this is true and anything else is wrong. Okay, that's one possibility disposed of. The dialogue continues. How then does Master Gautama hold the view that after death a Tathagata does not exist? Only this is true, anything else is wrong. Vaka, I don't hold the view that after death a Tathagata doesn't exist, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Now, if we've been in Aristotle's Lyceum, that will be the end of the dialogue, okay? Because uh, is it true? No. Is it false? No. End of story. But the dialogue actually continues. So it goes on. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view that after death a Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist, and only this view is true? Anything else is wrong. Vaka, I don't hold the view after death a Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist, only this is true. Anything else is wrong. Okay, so that's the third possibility. And then we continue. How then does Master Gautama hold a view after death 
A tathagata neither exists nor doesn't exist, and only this is true and anything else is wrong. Vaka, I don't hold a view after death that tathagata neither exists nor doesn't exist, only this is true and nothing else is wrong. All right, now you'll notice that the Buddha expresses at least scepticism about all four possibilities. Set that aside, I'll return to it briefly at the end. Uh, what you should notice about this dialogue is that the way that Vaka, the interlocutor, phrases the question, they're clearly assuming that there are four possibilities, that after death the enlightened person exists, doesn't exist, both or neither. That is a Chattrashkoti, okay? And the Chattrashkoti is clearly something that the social culture of the day is taking for granted. Um, so the history of the Chattrashkoti is clearly much earlier than the Sutras. So it goes back before the 5th century BCE. No one really knows how far it goes back, but it's clearly true that it's operative by the time the sutras are being composed. All right, so that's the uh, Chattrashkoti. Now, um, clearly, it flies in the face of the principles of excluding middle and non-contradiction. But uh, for all that, it's very, very easy to make sense of it. So you may wonder how the Chattrashkoti works, but it's actually quite easy to see how it works. So. In the last lecture, I drew a little picture. The picture was of the space of declarative sentences, and it was divided neatly between the trues and the falses. Let's revise that picture. So on the screen now, you can see another picture, and it's quartered, but the trues, again, occur in half, but they occur in the left-hand half, okay? And the falses occur in the bottom half, so truths on the left, falses on the bottom, and that gives us four quadrants. In the top left quadrant, things are true but not false, so they're true only. Okay. In the quadrant I've marked number two, things are neither true nor false. In the quadrant I've marked number three, things are both true and false, and in the quadrant I've marked number four, Things are false and not true, so they're false and false only. So now you have to think of the space of statements as divided up into essentially these four regions. And the four regions, the four quadrants, are exactly the four quadrants of the Chattrashkoti, the four possibilities of the Chattrashkoti. Now, you might wonder how negation works in this picture. And the answer is, it works in exactly the same way as it does in the previous picture. So remember that if you negate something true, it becomes false. And if you negate something false, it becomes true. All right. So what happens if something is both true and false? So if it's in quadrant that I've marked three. Well, if it's true, then its negation is false. If it's false, its negation is true. So if it's true and false, its negation is false and true. That's the same. So if something is in the third quadrant, so is its negation. Similarly, if something is in the second quadrant, it's neither true nor false. So if you negate it, its negation is going to be neither true nor false. So if something is in the second quadrant, so is its negation. So we haven't really made any change to the way that negation works, um, but the fact that we've got the four kotis of the Chattrash Koti allows us to uh, accept the fact that something can be true and true only, false and false only, both and neither. Now, let me uh, talk a little bit more about the history of the logic in the West, because the picture I've given you uh, about the way that this works is not esoteric. So uh, the sort of standard view of logic, that is the logic you will learn if you do Logic 100 at a university, is called classical logic. Uh, this is a complete misnomer. 
because it was invented at the end of the 19th century uh, and it's at odds with a number of the logical theories that came beforehand. Um, so really, classical logic has nothing to do with classics, nothing to do with ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient India. Um, it's just a name for the logical theory which was invented at the end of the 19th century by people like Russell and Frege and is now kind of orthodox. But in the second half of the 20th century, what we have seen is the development of a number of so-called non-classical logics. So these are logics which differ from classical logic. Now, the picture that I've just given you is one of these. Uh, I'm not going to tell you much about it. Its name is First Degree Entailment. Uh, and it's one of a family of many valued logics which can have more than two truth values. Okay, So as a many valued logic, this logic has four values, true only, false only, both and neither. And logics of this kind make perfectly good mathematical sense. Their mathematics is now well understood. We know how to work their proof systems, their semantics, their algebras. They're perfectly coherent mathematically. Now, that doesn't mean that they're correct any more than the fact that you've just got two values. That view is correct. What view of logic is correct is always going to be a substantial philosophical question. Um, all I'm pointing out at the moment is that this picture of many valued logic is perfectly mathematically coherent. And uh, you cannot argue for classical logic on the grounds that it's the only coherent view of logic. It isn't. Of course, the ancient Buddhists knew nothing about the developments in modern mathematics, mathematical logic. So uh, I'm not suggesting that they invented first degree entailment. That will be entirely anachronistic. But what I'm saying is the view of the Chattoscotti is a view of great antiquity, which you find in Buddhist logic, uh, which is very, very different from the Aristotelian view, embodying excluding middle and non-contradiction. Uh, and uh, it's, it's perfectly mathematically coherent. So uh, if nothing else, you can see the Buddhist view of the Chattoscotti as putting uh, a philosophical challenge to uh, standard views of Western logic and a challenge which is mathematically completely coherent. So, uh, unlike uh, the relationship of Buddhism to the physical sciences, where Buddhism and the physical sciences seem to work quite well together, here's a situation where a very traditional view about the nature of logic in Buddhism actually challenges a standard view in uh, Western logic. Okay, so let me, let me finish briefly by coming back to the fact that when Vaka, the interlocutor of the Buddha in the dialogue, asks the Buddha which koti, which corner of the Chattas koti we're in, the Buddha refuses to endorse any of them. Why? Well, different sutras give different answers to this question. So some of the uh, sutras continue, well, uh, why won't you answer the question? And the Buddha says, look, I'm uh, telling you how to live a better life and you want to do metaphysics? Come on, look, I'm giving you practical advice. You don't want to do this sort of philosophical stuff. I'm telling you how to improve your life. Okay, so that's how some of the sutras continue. And some of the sutras go a rather different way. They say, hey Buddha, how come you don't endorse any of these possibilities? And he says, well, none of them fits the case. And they say, what do you mean doesn't fit the case? Um, well, that question is sort of left hanging but it does rather look as though there's a fifth possibility. Now that thought lies dormant in Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist logic for about 700 years. And then it's picked up by uh, Nagarjuna. Uh, we will meet Nagarjuna again in the next lecture. Uh, and I don't intend to talk about the fifth possibility here, but I thought you might be interested to see how the dialogue continues in the case that we looked at. 
So just to summarize the main points where we've been today, I've been talking about a principle of Buddhist logic called the Chattrashkoti, the Four Corners. And the Four Corners are that if you have a declarative sentence, it can be true and true only, false and false only, both true and false, neither true nor false. The view is strongly uh, at odds with standard views in Western logic. However, modern developments in non-classical logic show that the view is perfectly coherent mathematically. So here we have the beginning of a debate in the philosophy of logic. Uh, which of these views, if either, is right? Now, that's uh, uh, an entirely different topic, and uh, I'm not going to go into that in these lectures, but you can just see how things stand with respect to these views. On the one hand, classical logic with its good in middle and non-contradiction, and the Chattrashkoti, which violates both. Thank you. Next time, we move on to something entirely different.